Good evening and welcome. Tonight we're going to be going over the history and geography of Bahrain. And we're going to start with Google Earth on the tablet because even though I have um, two maps and a whole book to show you guys, neither of them have a very good map of Bahrain. Like you can't really see anything that I want to talk about. So I'm going to show it to you on Google Earth first. Now you might be wondering, where is Bahrain? I don't see it anywhere. It is in Asia. Where could it be? Let's find out. We're going to zoom in to this island right here. I wonder if it'll pop up and say Bahrain. It's not. Anyway, I promise you, this is Bahrain. This is actually the main island called Bahrain. Bahrain has over 80 different islands associated with it. Um, starting down here, this is the Hawar Islands, and um, it was a bit of contention with Qatar, which is this nation right here. You can see the line dividing it. It had to go to The Hague to figure out who owned what islands, so these were officially given to Bahrain. They're mostly just sandy little islands. Little depot islands, I suppose. But let's head up here to the main little archipelago of Bahrain. Now you can see some really interesting shapes. And I see there's over 80 islands because most of them are artificial. Bahrain has 33 natural islands, so all the additional islands have just been added on. So let's go um, south to north to kind of look at this landscape. I don't want to look at it from that angle, though. I guess we are. Here we go. So to start off, look at this. <laughs> this is a huge project Bahrain is doing to create like a very fancy, fancy um, living space. Pretty much what the United Arab Emirates is doing. Apparently the Emirates has been copying Bahrain in these kind of ideas. You could see some very unusual shapes. You could see the fishies here. And they are pretty much done. I think, is it going to tell me what year this picture was taken? I think it's from 2019. It's not going to tell me. Um, but you can see that it's still under development, especially over here. This is not done at all. Only this center part, which just looks like a park, right? So it's still under construction, but it looks like the fish are all done. There's a big leak on that one. And it's pretty much just very nice homes with their pools. This side gets docks and uh, across the uh, football pitch there, this side gets swimming, I guess. And a couple docks there but for the most part. And yeah, that is this big old project over here with these very weirdly but cool shaped islands. My only thing about these kind of things is like, like say you live here and you have a heart attack and you call the ambulance. The nearest hospital I believe is up here. So they have to go wee woo 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 all the way over to you. Like, um, I was looking through here to see if there is any kind of just like regular, um, like community infrastructure other than parks. Doesn't look like it. If they are, they aren't labeled, but I don't see any schools. Like, um, uh, I can hear the bar train outside. It's like, imagine you live here and it's like your kid wants to go play at the park. They have to walk all the way down to here, which, is that a, that is a, a football pitch, right? It's not a tennis court. Anyway, lots of um, soccer or football pitches. Where did I see another one? I saw a random one oh, over here. Like this isn't developed, but they've got the pitch ready. <laughs> That's ready. The rest is still under construction. Looks like there's a big building here. The parking lot's all set up. Still under construction. 
Anyway, the rest of the land down here you can see is very, very barren. It's very deserty, a little rocky in the middle here, but for the most part, just like flat, deserty island living, which the, oh dear, I took a picture. <laughs> I didn't want to do that. Anyway, you can tell that um, the government is trying to get people to live down here. Um, they've been building a lot of things other than this luxury corner over here. Um, tiny little villages are starting to pop up. Here's a big old airport that they're building down here. I'll show you the main airport up there. There's a another little community. Looks like a farm right there. Of course, farming dates. But yeah, the government is slowly but surely building things out here. For example, the Lost Paradise of Dill Moon Water Park, which if you know my videos, you know I love water parks. Look at this place, it's gorgeous, out in the middle of nowhere. And we're gonna talk about Dill Moon and its history, but basically this whole park is like ancient Mesopotamia style themes. <laughs> we also have, let me zoom out a bit, a very fancy Formula One race track. It's huge. Look at all these tracks. It is massive. They have their own, um, oh, I forget what they call it in F1. Like a, a relay? No, I forget. They're, they have, they have their own race here. Maybe that's what it's called. I don't know. You can see the, the University of Bahrain is out here. We've got, um, and just other little landmarks, but the most important one, the biggest tourist draw is the Tree of Life. So as you can see, this is all very, very barren. There is nothing here for miles, except there is a random tree right here. A big old tree. Do you see it? There's like a place you can walk around and look at it. Let's look at some pictures of it. Just this random tree in the middle of nowhere. And it's been growing there for as long as people have known about it. And it's just kind of doing its own thing. Living off of those deep, deep, deep underwater wells that are under Bahrain. And, um, yeah, it's, it's a big tourist draw to go just see this little tree out in the middle of nowhere. It is pretty cool. <laughs> so let's head up north a bit. Oh, the other thing that's out here, I don't know if, um, we'll take a look at it, but, um, there's a wildlife preserve. Um, and where did it go? I think it's down here somewhere. But, um, it specializes in endangered animals and works on, like, breeding them to put them back out in the wild, and they've got stuff from, like, all over Asia and Africa. It's pretty cool. They've got lots of neat animals there. So as you can see, the more we go north, the more developed it's getting. And it's a very fancy, um, especially as we get up to the capital city up here of Panama. That is the capital. And um, yeah, I've said this before that I, I used to work at a, I used to um, book children's birthday parties before the pandemic, so Google will never stop showing me, like, children's attractions, so that's why those are always highlighted on my Google Earth, like Dolphin Resort and all that, but still, this is the capital city of Manama, huge, huge skyscrapers, I kept trying to do, like, um, Google Street Views, and I kept winding up in, like, a pizza hut, or restaurants and stuff, I was trying to see, like, you know, the traditional things, uh, but, all you could really see was <laughs> just shopping, shopping, shopping. So before we go look at the shopping, 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 I want to show you Bahrain Fort, which um, we might briefly mention in its history. This is one of the earliest buildings that's still surviving on Bahrain and where Bahrain gets its name from, because that was the, the name of the fort before it was the name of the island. So it's a, a very important, important, important landmark in Bahrain. I believe it's the oldest fort in Bahrain, I want to say. Or one of, definitely one of. So let's go look at the fancy, you can see the shadows from all the big skyscrapers, huh? The most famous one is this one right here. This is their World Trade Center. 
It's a little double tower there. I wonder if I can... Anyway, you'll see pictures of it in the book I have. It's a really interestingly designed building. This is the avenue here, which is a huge, huge shopping mall with all of the wonderful kind of mall stores, like fancy mall stores, you know. Up here is the Four Seasons, which this I think this whole complex belongs to the Four Seasons. But this is the main hotel, which I don't think I have... 3D on this map. No, but it's very flat. But it's also a massive building. It is like, look how far the shadow goes. I mean, we don't know what time of day this is, but yeah. Beautiful gardens and everything. And as you can tell, this is all reclaimed island, right? It's still being built upon. It's just all laid out, ready to be built on. Let me see if there's anything else I wanted to show you over here before we go to Muharak. I'm not sure. Um, mostly just other little buildings and things. Look at all the skyscrapers, all the shadows, you can see. Let's go to Muharak. This is, um, as you can see, another major city. It's on a natural island. They've got their bridge linking, it, linking to it. This is also where the airport is, the international airport. Look how absolutely massive it is. It is huge. But there's also lots of other man-made, wonderful, luxurious islands living out here. Let's see, look at this very precisely shaped one. <laughs> Still being developed. Again, I think these pictures are from like a couple years ago, so it's probably more built out now. You can see they're just starting to finish this one. It's still a little rough. But yeah, it's a big old sprawling. This is all shipping, you can tell. Shipping, shipping, shipping like crazy. Which has been what um, Bahrain has been about since the very beginning, right? Um, let me see. If I can remember where there's one... Um, housing place over here that I want to show you because there's a picture of it. I think it's over here, yeah. In my book that I'm going to show you, The Floating City, this is it. So when I show you the picture of The Floating City, this is where it's located. I think they're just houses that are built out over the water so it looks like they're floating. It's a neat idea. So let's check out one more thing I want to show you before we go to my map. I'm, I'm having fun as you can tell with the Google Earth. Which, oops, I don't want to go to SAR, thank you. Is, you can see this bridge over here it goes to this island. There's a lot of nothing. This is another natural island. Just a little way station there. A little parky area, a little farm. <laughs> but we go along this road, there's another natural island. And we drive down, 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 and we get to this island, which I'm pretty sure is an artificial one. Passport Center, the the Saudi Center, Saudi Customs, and we get through that and we drive, 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 across the Gulf, drive, 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 another little man-made island as you can tell, and boom, we are in Saudi Arabia, and that is the only link it has to the mainland. Let me show you its neighbors, look how long, it is 17 miles long, it's quite a drive. But, as you can see, it's the only way that Bahrain is linked to the mainland. Apparently, Bahrain and Qatar have been working on a bridge to go this way, right here. But, it's been delayed, and there's been political tensions, and who knows if it'll ever actually get built. I think it's been started and stopped like a million times. So, here's little Bahrain. And here, of course, is Saudi Arabia, like I showed you. There's Qatar, there's the Emirates, the United Arab Emirates, and up here is Iran, specifically like the Zagros mountain area, and uh, Shiraz is the nearest like major, major city. I mean, Kuwait and Iraq is up there as well, but they're not going to really pertain to the story as much. I said I'm not going to mention that part. <laughs> I've edited that out of my notes. And then lastly, I want you to take note of all of this magnificent coral that's out here. And that's something that the Bahraini government, from what I've read, is really working hard to try to preserve. Um, 
mostly because they never really have ever in its history. They've been like chipping at it. The ancient cultures used it, the coral to build their houses, which some are still standing. Um, so I, I feel like just in the past couple decades, they're like, hey, we should probably protect this coral. It's really pretty, it brings in all the tourists. So that's another thing. So that's what I wanted to show you with Bahrain. Let me switch over to the map so I can talk about history and then we'll look through the little book. So yeah, this is the best map of Bahrain that I have. It's right here. <laughs> it's so small, but it's a tiny little island. So yeah, <laughs> there is a big map in here, but it's not very detailed. It's just like a very basic political map, which doesn't really show you all the things I want to show you. So. There are some wonderful pictures in here, though. We will flip through and look through them. But let's talk about the history of this tiny little, very interesting island, as you saw. Very interesting place. So, like I said, with the water park, the first civilization that we know of in Bahrain was the Dilmun, like, culture city area. It wasn't just in Bahrain, it was also all along the coast here. They're finding more and more evidence of the Dilmun culture outside of Bahrain, but it was definitely centered in Bahrain. All their homes and pretty much all of the main archaeological finds are in Bahrain. And they found some interesting things. They found some items from the Indus Valley civilization and some items from Mesopotamia right up, up there. <laughs> And that kind of makes sense because Mesopotamia is just a boat ride up here. Indus Valley is just a boat ride over here. Well, around the Strait of Hormuz, but you get what I mean. It's pretty much right in the middle. So Dilmun was a center of trade. From what we know about it, there's really not much written about it. What we do know is that it was a very central place in the world at that time. It's mentioned in the Epic of Gilgamesh, and there are some very early mentions of it in Mesopotamian cuneiform writing, but other than that, that's pretty much all that we really know about them. There's still some homes, the, the fort was eventually built in a little bit. But that's pretty much all that we know about them, which is why theming that water park after Dil Moon is really cool. The, the Bahrainis, from what I can tell, are very proud of the Dil Moon culture. So, I mean, it, does, it did sound very neat. They had evidence of weapons and soldiers, but there's no evidence of them ever waging a war. No mention of it whatsoever. They were just hanging out here trading. The, the weapons and soldiers are probably just defense which they would need eventually, because eventually they were conquered. Um, you know, there's, again, this is going to be an abbreviated history, and I'm, I'm going to gloss over quite a few of the conquerors of the area, but what you need to know is that the Assyrians really took hold of this area, and once the Babylonians conquered the Assyrians, then the Babylonians had control of this area, and then once the Persians took over the Babylonians, then the Achaemenid Persian Empire had control of the area. Which I feel like I've talked about so many times. I've just covered a lot of histories that the Achaemenid Empire was a part of. It was, it was huge for its time. Then Alexander the Great comes and completely destroys the entire Achaemenid Empire and takes it over. So, technically, this area... I can unstick myself, it's very hot tonight, but what else is new? Um, became the territory of Alexander the Great, and he had sent deputies over to the island here to check it out and report back, and they reported back that there's lots of trees, they have fresh water under the earth, and, um, you know, lots of nice people there, so Alexander's like, great, let's head over there, and three days before he was due to attack Bahrain, he died. So the the chaos that ensued after Alexander passing was evident all throughout his brand new empire he had formed, and various generals of his took pieces of land and ruled. So at first it was part of the Parthians, which were an interesting people. They were kind of a semi-nomadic, like, horse people. <laughs> it's the best way to describe them. Then eventually the Sassanids came in, which were an empire in 
Persia, what is today Iran. And they held pretty tight control for a while, and it was like that, pretty much, pretty much like that, until Islam came in. At the time, there, there were quite a few Christians on the island. They were under Byzantine influence, but the Byzantine Empire did not control them. And it was mostly pagans and a few Christians, a few Jews. So when Islam came around, um, Muhammad himself sent deputies over to convert the people. It sounded like a great new thing to be a part of, and most of the population converted fairly quickly. Well, Muhammad was still alive and everything, which probably was really neat. And um, this is where I'm going to start summarizing some historical things, because the rise and fall of various dynasties and clans and families and Islamic sects was a long list. Bahrain was struggled over so many times. And so many times the whatever power was in Persia would come in and take over and stop it and then they would weaken and then some other family would come in and take over and start their dynasty. And it just repeated for decades upon decades upon decades. The one interesting one was an Islamic sect known as the Karmashians who took over Bahrain to make it an island paradise, like their main base. But they were vicious. What they did, I'm like still shocked over this, I didn't know this. They attacked Medina and Mecca, and they stole the black stone out of the Kaaba. If you don't know, the Kaaba is the most sacred shrine in Islam. It's the metaphorical house of God. And the black stone was a very sacred stone way before Islam. I guess it was like a meteorite is the theory, but they say that it like Adam and Eve had the black stone and everything. It wasn't black back then, but the, the stone, you know. Um, so Muhammad himself put the black stone at the Kaaba. And yeah, so the fact that these people came and took it and um, when they finally returned it, it was in pieces. It was in, what was it, seven different pieces, which it still is today. It's back at the Kaaba. Uh, it's very sacred. It's the black stone because apparently any time a sinner would touch it, it would get blacker and blacker. And now it's like black, black. That's the legend. But like the gall, the audacity, like to just snatch, like I was trying to think like what's the Christian equivalent of the black stone? I really couldn't think of one. Like there's, there isn't like an item in Christianity that I know of that is the kind of revered significance of the black stone at the Kaaba in Mecca. I'm like, anyway, that I was like, what? <laughs> I went on a deep dive. It was a wild story, but that sect, as you can imagine, got beat up by a lot of different powers because how dare they? Like, my goodness. <laughs> anyway, moving forward into history, skipping over the multitude of dynasties and conquerors that were in the area. The Portuguese arrived in 1521, and they said, these shipping routes are pretty cool, we want to have them. And they started to conquer the Persian Gulf, Gulf of Oman, Strait of Hormuz area here, and thus they pretty much set up a base, mainly at Bahrain, other places too, like Oman and stuff, but mostly they, they had their eyes on Bahrain until the um, Iranians had enough. And they said, listen, this is our island. It's been our island since a long time ago. You know, the, the Achaemenids had control of this island. This is our island. Get out of here. And Shah Abbas, the, the Shah of Iran at the time in 1602, waged war against the Portuguese and kicked them out of Bahrain. Get out of here. Now, if you don't know your, um, your different Islamic sects, the two biggest ones are Sunni and Shiite. And the Iranians are very devout Shiites. Um, most places are Sunni, so having a like a, a devout Shiite country is very rare. But there were Shiites in Bahrain before this, but after the Persians kicked the Portuguese out, many more Shiites were living on Bahrain. Today it's kind of like 60-40, with 60 being the number of Shiites, and maybe like 70-30, but it's majority Shiite country. Which again is unusual. Um, maybe I'll get into the details of that. 
But I can do a whole series on like how Catholicism and Orthodox Christianity split, how Sunni and Shiite split. Anyway, it's a long story. That's all you really have to know. Uh, the, the Shia population grew after that happened. In 1799, a new family moved into the island from Qatar. They were the Al Khalifa family, and they had been evidently booted out of Kuwait by the Ottomans. And they decided to, after they moved to Qatar, they decided to set up shop in Bahrain. And at this time, it was a fairly chaotic time in Bahrain. You know, technically Iran had control over it, but they weren't really doing much. There was kind of a lot going on up in Iran. So various, like like I said, dynasties and families and groups and things were taken over. One having more power over the other every day of the week. It was very chaotic. So when Britain started to snoop around this area, you know, it's very important to their trade in India. They thought maybe we should kind of stabilize Bahrain a little bit. And they worked with the Al Khalifa family. And Britain decided that the Al Khalifas were in charge. And they drafted a little peace negotiation in 1820. They would sign various other treaties, especially after um, Saudi Arabia invaded at one point. Oman invaded at one point. The British had to come in and... Um, help out the Al Khalifas. So more and more treaties were signed over the 1800s to the point where in 1892 Britain annexed Bahrain, which upset many people. They didn't want to be part of Britain. Um, there was a big uprising beginning in 1895, but um, as the British Empire were good at at this time period, they squashed that and kept controlling the island. The main industry in Bahrain at this time was pearling. It was huge. That's why I chose these nails, because I wanted the pearls. <laughs> um, yeah, and it was an interesting industry. Basically, there was a pearl season. They would go out on their little pearling ships, which are basically like huge dows, and they would go under holding their breaths and snatch up oysters and haul them back up to the boats. They had a um, singer on board. His job was to just keep them entertained during the pearling months. Um, and it was a highly profitable industry in Bahrain. It was all throughout the coast here, but very much so in Bahrain. They were considered the best pearls in the world. And it got them a bunch of money, especially in the beginning of the like early 20th century. So there was a huge boom in pearls. Um, not to mention oil was discovered in 1932 in Bahraini waters. So they knew they had that industry going on too, which was great because the pearling industry tanked in the 1930s. It was the depression and Japan invented cultivated pearls. So There's no more need to swim under the water, hold in your breath and grab an oysters. So it really relied on that for a while, skipping ahead to 1971 where Iran, the uh, Shah at the time, before the revolution, was like, hey, we own this island, right? And they were like, no, especially Saudi Arabia, who's majority Sunni country, we're like, definitely not. And um, Iran's like, well, you know, Britain's going to start giving up independence soon, or giving out independence soon. We should have this island. I mean, Iran did try to snoop into a lot of countries in the area over here, just to expand, 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 right? So they went, they, Bahrain went to the United Nations and talked to Great Britain and figured things out, and they were eventually granted independence as their own thing, mostly so Iran couldn't come in and snatch them up. They wanted their own independence, which makes sense. So the oil industry was taking off massively. I mean, there was about to be a dip in the mid 70s, but it took off in Bahrain. Um, and also they developed a big banking industry after the Lebanese civil war broke out. Most of the banking in this corner of the world happened in Beirut. Once the civil war broke out, it moved down to Bahrain. Very, very wealthy and all of those wonderful industries you see starting to spring up, the uh, artificial islands being built, 
all of the attractions and a big boost in the tourism industry, highlighting the ancient history of Bahrain, uh, the bridge to Saudi Arabia. Lots of Saudis apparently go to Bahrain to play, <laughs> like go shopping and hanging out on the weekend and go party. So it, you know, in, in an economic sense, Bahrain is absolutely thriving. Economically, they're doing fantastic. They're, yeah, they're going up and there's really no sign of them coming down, especially since they've been diversifying the economy so it's not so oil reliant. So whenever those oil wells do dry up, eventually, um, they have so many things to fall back on. So in, in that sense, it's great. But let's talk about what's going on politically. The, um, the first big modern uprising was in 1981. There was a failed coup. This was after the Iranian Revolution. And um, the Shiites here were kind of wanting the same thing to happen here, since the Khalifas are Sunni. And the majority, like I said, is a Shia population. So they attempted to install a Shiite sheikh, but that failed. And, you know, the, the Al Khalifas were none too happy about that. The protests started back up around the mid-90s or so, kind of wanting more political reform, more democratic say in their country, which um, slowly but surely happened. The sheikh at that time rearranged things to make Bahrain an emirate, so he became the emir, and then he passed away in 1999, not long after that. So his son took over, and he's still the current leader that is um, uh, Hamad bin Isa al Khalifa, and he decided to take things even more progressively, like giving women the right to vote. What a concept! <laughs> and um, just adding more power to the parliament. I'm stuck to this page. Okay, <laughs> um, there we go. Adding more power to the government and reworking the constitution. There was a referendum on how the new government should be made. Evidently, they voted to have a um. Oh, I forgot the name of it. It's not a constitutional monarchy. It's a parliamentary a monarchy. I believe that's what it's called, the parliamentary monarchy. So the uh, emir became the king. So today he is the king of Bahrain. This is the kingdom of Bahrain. People are allowed to vote for members of parliament, but most of the major leaders are from the Al Khalifa family. And... You know, there there was a shakeup in how the government's run, which is what the protesters wanted, but that the outcome wasn't quite what they wanted. They wanted more democracy, and they got a kingdom. So once the Arab Spring protests in 2011 swept the area, they sprung up big time in Bahrain. People wanting more, um, you know, democracy in their government, and they wanted less discrimination against Shia Muslims. And the government answered that very violently. Um, many people lost their lives. The, the, my gosh, it was a horrible back and forth during those protests and it took a while for it to calm down, but eventually it did. And that led to really more of a crackdown on, I want to say like human rights. Like um, if you oppose the government, you're thrown in jail, you could never be seen again. Um, the media is highly, highly controlled. It's all state-run media now. Things like that. Um, the, the press is classified as not free in Bahrain. It's uh, kind of yucky in terms of how the government's ran in Bahrain. But you wouldn't know it just from looking at it. Because if you're a tourist visiting Bahrain, it looks like the most beautiful place with the most friendly people and luxury shopping. You can eat any kind of food you can imagine. Any kind of restaurant any kind of luxury beach house, you know, so much to do and see in Bahrain, but behind the scenes, it's a pretty corrupty government, you know, and that's pretty much where we are today. So let me unstick myself from my book before I damage the pages anymore. And let's look at some pictures. Check out this cover. It's the world's happiest man. He is so excited. <laughs> he is happy. That's a happy man. So this is that World Trade Center building I told you about. It's got these cool windmills in the middle of it. Kind of trying to look like 
boat sails and the wind. It's, it's a neat architectural concept. There it is, kind of in the distance there. This is a cool building too. It's meant to look like an oil drill. And uh, this is a very old picture because now there's skyscrapers all over here. <laughs> Looks like it's still all in development. But neat framing of the building. <laughs> here is from the Bahrain Fort here, Khat Bahrain. Here's the Four Seasons. You can see like just how huge that is. That's some rock in the background there and all the shopping around it. It's an absolutely gorgeous place to stay. Let's see, some Shia slogans. It says, I cannot read Arabic, so I cannot tell you what it would say. Another beautiful shot of the World Trade Center in Manama. Look at this. This is the highest point in Bahrain. I should have showed you. It's also called the Dragon Rocks, because um, it looks like a dragon. Isn't that neat? <laughs> but yeah, that's the highest point in Bahrain. Not very high. Here's a map of the Persian Gulf. This talks about how some countries refer to it as the Arabian Gulf, because they don't like the Persian connotation. It is, you know, <laughs> most maps say Persian Gulf, so that's what I say, but um, anyway. <laughs> I know when I did Kuwait, someone left a very angry comment about that. So I'm, mm, okay. <laughs> This what it is, right? Let's see, these are Chikara, apparently, that live in the wildlife park that I mentioned. And of course, the date palms. I didn't show you all the big old, like, they're basically plantations at that point. They're huge. This is another shot of Manama, all the big, big, big buildings. And those very strange islands I showed you. Look, this was before the fish were done, too. How neat. This is Rifa, which is kind of like a suburb of Manama, but it has a lot of history in it as well. And here's a mall in Muharraq. Lots of shopping, oh my gosh. This is the Rifa Fort. And these are some seals from Dilmun. I think these were found in Mesopotamia, I want to say these ones specifically, but they're from Dilmun. Isn't that neat? Kind of more evidence of the trade that happened. Let's see, here is another shot of the Kavat al Bahrain fort. It's left a bit very, very old building. And here it is again. Very old place. And um, a very old mosque as well. Sheikh Salman bin Hamad al Khalifa in 1945. And here is the current Prime Minister. It's Khalifa bin Salman al Khalifa. So if you don't know how Arab names work, that's the first name. Bin means son of, and for girls it's um bit, right? Bint, yeah, bint. Bint with the T at the end. So, um, Khalifa, son of Salman, who we saw on the other page, and then the name of the clan slash their last name, a Khalifa. So his name is pretty much, in Western terms, his name would be Khalifa Khalifa, which that's pretty neat. And here's a big old poster of the king, which these are everywhere. His face is on everything. Here's one of the protests during 2011. Looks like they're beating up a, a cop car there. We go flying from Bahrain for it, all the skyscrapers in the background. And here is the king himself. So, Hamad bin Isa al Khalifa is his name. And this is the leader of the Shiite opposition party. It says he was sentenced to life in prison in 2018 for spying for Qatar. We're going to visit Qatar at the end of this week, so we'll hear the other side of the story. The, the Battle of the Gulf, I suppose. The the ongoing tension <laughs> happening there. Here's an election booth there. And um, 
this is a actually don't be scared <laughs> it's not what you think this this is a navel drill in Manama um, there is a I think it's on the next page here yeah there is a US presence in Bahrain the fifth fleet is stationed there um, lots of um, US military stationed in Bahrain and lots of um, I should say like naval soldiers lots of Navy action happening there I think British th yeah the British have a naval base there also and there there's the US fifth fleet <laughs> That's their little base. This is a statue to commemorate the Pearlers. Isn't that fantastic? Wow. That's a very well-designed statue. And this is on an old Pearler boat. They've got all the oysters and they're cracking them open to see what they've got. And that's how they would crack them open. See if there's any pearls inside. If you don't know, um, oysters, you know, they're little shellfish. And if any dirt or sand or anything gets into their shells, they'll attack it, because that's like their mouths, right? They'll attack it with, um, like, coating it in some kind of, like, oystery material, and it grows and grows and grows to the point where it becomes a pearl. So not all pearl oysters have pearls, only the ones that had little things seep into them. An oil facility here. And... Their currency, they use the Bahraini dinar. They're making, it's an aluminum workshop, it says, making some canisters and boxes out of aluminum. Here's the stock exchange in Bahrain. Very gorgeous building. I mean, all the buildings in Bahrain are absolutely gorgeous, but it's pretty design. And here's the F1 circuit. The Grand Prix, that's the word I was looking for. They have their own Grand Prix. Wow. <laughs> Completely forgot. Some beautiful flamingos. And this is a desalination plant. So like I said in history a couple times, they had freshwater springs. They were very famous for all the fresh water they had on this island. Pretty much 99% of it is dried up at this point. Um, not just from the environment, but from overuse. So desalination is how most of the people there get water. This is to show off the artificial islands there. It's interesting. Look at this mosque is in the middle of a roundabout. <laughs> Where do you park? <laughs> like, you can't park, I guess, across the street, right? And then you gotta cross. Anyway, that's clever. There's the tree of life that we got to see. Very interesting. Some cormorants here. This is on the Hawar Islands, it says. There's a tailor. Very fancy shop there. A little parade. Some street performers. And just like in the UAE, there are many, many expats and foreigners working in Bahrain. It's the disparity, the population disparity is not as bad as the UAE, but it's still overwhelming. It's something like what, like 70% of the country are immigrants or expats or foreign workers, something like that. Now this is neat. I've seen these face coverings before, but there's usually like a, a shawl over, so it's not touching your bare skin, but interesting. And this is in a mosque. There's some abayas here, so if you're a woman and you come to see the mosque, and you're not dressed properly, you can snag one of these and you can be in the building and be respectful. The shop is selling headdresses. Like, you could look just like this guy. <laughs> and, oh my gosh, did anyone do this when they were a kid? I was way too chicken. I didn't like jumping off the swings. I didn't like standing on the swings. The most brave thing I would do is sit backwards on the swing. <laughs> look at this face. <laughs> what a happy, happy kid splashing in the water. One of the many great joys of childhood, right? Splashing in the water is so much fun. Here's, um, this it says he's showing these kids how to plant seeds. Isn't that neat? That's pretty cool. And here's a bride at her hen and night, getting ready for the big day. That's such a fun tradition. Working hard in school. Apparently she's working very hard. She looks very tired. <laughs> what else do we have? 
This is the Sheikh Isa Church. Church. <laughs> My bad. Apologies. <laughs> the Sheikh Isa Mosque. Holy moly. It is very church like, though, with the columns and the fancy door and everything. It's beautiful. Now here it comes. There's always a picture of Mecca. When I was, um, I have two books for Qatar. I'm only going to show you one, but I flipped through both of them like, where's the Kaaba? Where's the Kaaba? And boom. They both have every country I do that has a Muslim majority, even if they're not an Arab country, there's a picture of Mecca in it every single time. So anyway, and this is Ashura, which is a Shiite, um, I hesitate to say festival because it's a morning festival. It's, it's to recognize a death that basically started the split between Sunni and Shiite. So it's a sad day. It's, um, I guess kind of like Ash Wednesday for Catholics. Like it's not happy Ash, like it's not one that you like celebrate joyously. It's one that you recognize and mourn, you know. This is the first mosque in Bellarine, the Alkamis Mosque. Looks like that's all that's left of it. And these girls are studying their Qurans. You can see the little things that they put the books on there so they can study. And the Al Fatah Grand Mosque in Manama, the largest mosque in the country. Reading the Arabic newspaper there. A street sign. Apparently pretty much everyone in Bahrain speaks English. Mostly for, you know, there's a lot of business going on and lots of tourists. It just helps out. And traditional basket weaving here. Sorry about the dog barking in the background if you can hear that. A band putting on a show at the airport for visitors. A potter making some fantastic crafts here. Wow. Very beautiful. And we've got um, the Sheikh Issa bin Ali Al Khalifa house, where you would have lived, I suppose. The National Theater, which is a gorgeous building. Then again, all the buildings are gorgeous, right? Here's the floating city I showed you before. It's really cool. It's probably neat when you're like there and it looks like all the buildings are on the water floating on it. Of course, playing some football. It's a huge sport there. As you saw, all the little pitches in the neighborhoods. And a famous um, sprinter or 1500 meter race. Yusuf Jamal. The city at night. Isn't that pretty? And this is in the Avenue Shopping Mall that I showed you. This is National Day. Big celebration, big parade. Here's another picture from Ashura, which kind of shows you what kind of holiday it's like. It's, it's a sad day. You're supposed to like cry and weep and mourn and all of that. And this is not what you think it is. <laughs> Calm down. That is a cannon firing to mark the sunset during um, Ramadan saying, hey, the sun's down, time to eat. <laughs> and here's the food that you eat. Some very the delectable looking looks like little tomatoes or something, right? All covered in honey. Mmm, this looks so good. <laughs> That's pretty much how meals are served. Everyone sits around and you reach in with your right hand and eat. And you can go get some coffee. And you can go shop at the souk everything you could ever need at the souk. Some more foods. Bahraini chicken and rice. Just, I mean, chicken and rice. You can't go wrong. <laughs> and bread pudding. So good. And then here's the map that I really didn't want to show you because it's just like, what am I supposed to show you? Like, here's the island. <laughs> There's the bridge. You know? <laughs> so that's why I showed you Google Earth. But that's going to be it for tonight. Thank you so much for watching. I do hope that you found this video relaxing and educational if you look at the happy man as I end the video. I hope that you have a very good, good, good night. Good night.